Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, we hear from Professor Martin Daunton about the United Kingdom in 1919 and the economic legacy of the war. I'm Martin Daunton, Emeritus Professor of Economic History at the University of Cambridge. I've written about British economic history since 1700. Most recently, I've worked on public finance and taxation since the Napoleonic Wars up to the present day. By the end of the war, most commodities were controlled in their prices and their distribution. Rationing had been introduced. The government had taken control over the railways, over shipping, over coal. The British economy had been totally devoted to the war effort. So you have an immediate issue at the end of the war about what should the post-war British economy look like. Would there be a sudden removal of controls, an attempt to go back to 1914? Or should there be a long period of adjustment? That was the big debate in November 1918 into 1919. In 1919, the economy boomed. The country lacked many commodities during the war. And at the end of the war, there was a need to restock all of the domestic goods, the foodstuffs that were needed, and prices just ripped. The problem was that controls had been taken off and there was this sudden, very short-lived and very unstable boom. The end of the war really disrupts a lot of social relationships. There'd be very high levels of taxation on business. Landlords had rent control in 1915. At the same time, the trade unions had been able to increase their wages. So there's a big debate over who is losing, who is gaining from the war. Workers coming back from the war wanted their jobs back. But women had taken those jobs. Unskilled workers had gained tremendously during the war because of labour shortages, to use the phrase at the time, had diluted the skills. How would the returning soldiers be reintegrated into the labour market? So in 1919, you have a huge number of disputes going on. Most famously, in January 1919... Red Clyde side. There was social unrest in Glasgow. They call to arms to the workers for a general strike to demand a 40-hour working week. This is seen as a revolutionary outbreak, which some people thought at the time was going to be like the Red Revolution in 1917 in Russia. This was a slightly paranoid view by the security services. In fact, a lot of this uprising, as they saw it in Glasgow, was simply for the skilled workers to get back their jobs in the shipyards. The government in 1919 is in a dilemma. Since 1918, adult working men have all had the vote, even some women but only over the age of 30 with property qualifications. So Lloyd George, with the rise of the Labour Party, which had now got about 20% of the vote in the 1918 election, had to try and provide what the workers wanted. At the end of the war, Lloyd George was making promises that the workers would return to a new home fit for heroes. There was a great shortage of housing, but whilst rents were controlled, private owners were not going to build any more. So what he wanted to do was to build 500,000 council-owned houses to remove that shortage. But the problem is that during a post-war boom of very high prices, labour shortages, shortage of resources, the houses were much more expensive to build than was originally anticipated, and the programme had to be stopped. On the other hand, Lloyd George is facing outcry from middle-class people who were being squeezed by taxation, who had not been able to gain so much from wage demands because they're not unionised, they wanted a massive cut in government spending. So the government was caught between these two views and they thought that perhaps the best thing to do was to go back to 1914. That was the motto of the time. In 1914, Britain had been the world's dominant economic power. Could we go back to it again? But one way of doing that 
so they thought, was to return to the gold standard, which had been suspended during the war. The gold standard is essentially pegging the pound to the value of a certain fixed amount of gold, as indeed was the United States dollar. So the gold content of a dollar and a pound was at a fixed exchange rate of one pound to four dollars eighty six cents. But because of the rapid inflation at the end of the First World War, the pound was now overvalued by perhaps twenty percent. And if we did not reduce our prices to get back the old exchange rate, then we would lose our export markets. The problem was that going back to that old exchange rate meant. Deflating the economy, trying to reduce wages, trying to control spending by higher interest rates, and of course, what that did was turn the boom of 1919 into a massive slump. So the problem at the end of the war isn't so much the impact of the war itself; it's the policy decisions taken to adjust to peace. The First World War marks one of the most Radical redistributions of income and wealth that Britain has ever seen. So, who gained and who lost? The major gainers were labour, particularly the unskilled working class. Workers were in short supply during the war, so unskilled wages went up rapidly, and they held on to that gain. On the other hand, middle class people were not unionised and were not able to increase their wages to anything like the same extent. They felt that they were being squeezed out. House landlords lost because their rents were controlled. Tenants gained. People who had invested overseas. There was a massive boom of overseas investment before the First World War. They lost because they had to sell off their assets during the war. So you have a situation at the end of the First World War where middle class people. Felt that their position in society was being eroded. One of the expressions of this is a novel, one of the best sellers in the interwar period, Warwick Deeping's *Sorrel and Son*. It came out in 1925. It was expressing this sense of social disruption. The story is of an army officer returning at the end of the war to find that his wife has run off with another man. She has left him with his son Kit. He can't go back to his old middle-class job. He seems to have been squeezed out. He ends up working in various menial tasks as he sees it. His son has to go to a council school where he is despised for speaking properly, of washing the children of the working class. It says they don't wash. There was a feeling by the middle classes that the proper order was being completely. Overturned. This is at a time when the Labour Party, in its new constitution, is arguing for the nationalisation of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. It seems to be a threat to property, and this threat to property, middle class property, was most expressed in the argument of the Labour Party in 1919 for a capital levy, a one-off tax on all property. In order to pay off the national debt, during the war, labour had been conscripted. People had been sent to their deaths, to injury. They'd lost their jobs. Meanwhile, people with wealth had stayed at home. So it was argued, and made large profits, had invested in government debt, and were now being paid the interest on that debt at the end of the war, out of taxation on workers. Hence, said the Labour Party, the best thing to do. Is to have a conscription of wealth in the same way as a conscription of labour. Now you can imagine what people who owned small amounts of property thought about this. They thought that this was socialism run riot, and in fact, the Labour Party started to think, well, perhaps this is playing into the hands of our political opponents. We better be a bit careful about this. So one of the big debates at the end of the war is this. Conflict between property and labour, and how to work that through at a time when, throughout Europe, there seemed to be revolution in the air. There had been the Russian Revolution. There were uprisings in Berlin, the Spartacus movement in Munich. The resolution of the problems at the end of the First World War 
was actually remarkably successful. The economy did suffer from returning to the gold standard and deflation, which led to high levels of unemployment and to low levels of economic growth. There was huge unrest in 1919. The general strike of 1926 as a result of Labour's opposition to the attempt to cut wages. On the other hand, Britain did not actually experience the social disruption over the slightly longer term that was found in both continental Europe. We didn't have the rise of fascism. We did not have displaced soldiers being radicalised. Britain, in fact, returns to a fairly stable set of class relationships by the mid-1920s, despite the general strike. Why was this? Partly it's because, despite the attempt to cut waste at the end of the war, to reduce the level of social spending, it actually went up. The level of taxation before the First World War was about 10% of the national income. In the interwar period, it's more like 20 25%. A lot of that went on welfare spending. So despite the fact there was a cutting back of the homes for heroes at the end of the war, Britain still had what seems to be in international terms a more generous welfare system than in France, in Germany, the United States. This helps to stabilise the economy when the Wall Street crash hits in 1929, followed by the Great Depression in 1931. The long-term consequence of the mistakes at the end of the First World War was a much more sensible and constructive approach at the end of the Second World War. The end of the Second World War led to growth. The end of the First World War led to slump. Of course, people in 1945 knew what had gone wrong in 1919. There was a famous article by R.H. Tawney, an economic historian, in 1945, pointing out that controls had been taken off the economy too soon in 1919. So at the end of the Second World War, rationing continued into the early 1950s. The other major difference was that we did not go back to the gold standard. There was a realisation that you should not deflate the economy to keep a fixed exchange rate. Interest rates were kept low after the Second World War, unlike the high interest rates after the First World War. There was also a very different attitude towards the national debt, the huge amount of borrowing which had been accumulated during both world wars. At the end of the First World War, that debt was very high, and because interest rates were high, the cost of servicing that was high. At the end of the Second World War, interest rates were low, and the cost of servicing the national debt were lower. It was therefore possible to spend at least some money on creation of the National Health Service, for example. At Versailles, there was an attempt to impose reparations, which John Maynard Keynes warned in his famous book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace in 1919, would lead to massive disruption of the world economy. At the end of the Second World War, Keynes had been the key player in the creation of the Bretton Woods system to try and create international harmony and order in the world economy. Another person who shows continuity between the end of the First World War and the end of the Second World War, and of the lessons to be learned from the experience of the First World War, was Hugh Dalton. At the end of the First World War, Hugh Dalton was a major supporter of the capital levy, the conscription of wealth. At the end of the Second World War, he did not want a capital levy. Instead, he said, why don't we just have low interest rates and therefore the middle classes won't be getting so much out of their investments. He was the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the post-war Labour government. So he was very conscious indeed of the mistakes, of the political tensions at the end of the First World War and how to treat them differently at the end of the Second World War. Professor Martin Daunton on the United Kingdom in 1919 and the economic legacy of the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government.
It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, Matthew Lee, head of film at the Imperial War Museum, and pianist Stephen Horne discuss films of the home front and their music.